All right, so we reviewed the basic point of a monopolistic market, which is that um, there were two sort of major points we discussed yesterday. Uh, first is monopolies are inefficient. Under the assumption that the monopolist can, has to stick to the law of one price, right? cannot charge different prices from different customers, you cannot do non-linear pricing, charging different prices for different quantities bought. Uh, it has to be the same unit price for all customers and all units. Under that assumption, uh, monopolies are inefficient. They create dead weight losses. Uh, we saw that mathematically. Uh, we can also see it diagrammatically, which is you must have seen in undergraduate. Um, this is the demand curve. This is the marginal cost curve of the monopolist. <clears throat> and uh, remember the, what we derived, that uh, the optimum output level for the monopolist is a point where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. And marginal revenue is calculated taking into account the nature of the demand curve, right? especially its slope. Uh, the monopolist is aware that if he wants to sell more, for example, that he has to lower the price to accommodate those, those extra sales. Otherwise, people won't buy that extra amount. So marginal revenue equal to marginal cost. Now, it's easy to show, and I'll discuss in a second, that the marginal revenue curve, if you draw it in this diagram, it will lie below the demand curve. Okay, let's take that as given for now. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just going to revisit that. So the red line is the marginal revenue curve. Notice I've drawn it below the blue demand curve. And so its intersection with marginal cost is where the monopolist will pick his choice. And so that means uh, the quantity QM will be this, and this is the monopoly price. And immediately we can see from the picture that the monopolist produces less than a competitive market and charges more. Um, now, why is marginal revenue below the demand curve? Uh, let's link it to the maths first, and then we'll intuitively try to understand it. Well, if you go back to the mathematical condition we derived for marginal revenue, this is, this is the equation, right? On the left-hand side, you have marginal revenue. Notice that it has two terms. The first term is just the price itself, and the second term involves the derivative of the inverse demand function. And this is a negative term, yes? So the demand curve, when we draw it, plot it in a diagram, essentially for every quantity, it basically plots this. What is the price at which consumers are willing to buy that quantity, right? That's one way of looking at the demand curve. So if the second term was absent, if you only had the first term, then um, drawing the left-hand side or plotting or drawing a graph for the left-hand side would have just been the demand curve itself. Okay. But there's the second term sitting here there, and it's a negative term. And that means that the graph of the left-hand side of the mar marginal revenue curve will be below the demand curve, right? For any quantity, the demand curve captures the price at which that quantity can be sold to consumers. The marginal revenue curve captures that price minus something. And that's why it's throughout below. Now, what is the intuitive sense? Okay, so as I have uh, tried to stress that, you know, you, you try to understand uh, key concepts at many levels, you try to understand it with the most powerful general mathematical tools, you try to understand with, with pictures, and you try to understand it intuitively. And once you have you, you have developed the skill of drawing connections between these multiple interpretations of every concept, every reasoning, then you have become a good microeconomist. So let's try to do that. Let's, let's bring in the third aspect, which is what is the intuition? The intuition is that uh, uh, starting from some quantity, if the monopolist wants to produce and sell a little bit more, well, on that marginal quantity, he can charge whatever price the market will take, okay? So that part is straightforward. Uh, a car company is making 1,000 cars and they're considering uh, producing 1,001 car. So that 1,001st car can be sold at a price 
right? Which can you can read off from the demand function. So the marginal revenue, of course, consists of that price. But here's the catch: uh, in order to sell an extra car, uh, you have to stay on the demand curve, and so you have to lower the price on the first one thousand cars you were planning to sell. If you're just making 1,000 cards, you can maybe charge uh, 10 lakh rupees per car. Uh, if you're planning to sell 1,001, uh, 1, an extra car, you know that you cannot charge 10 lakhs anymore. Maybe you can charge nine and a half, half lakhs. So for the first 10,000 cars, you are having to give a discount on half a lakh. And that is a source of loss. And that is exactly what the second term in our marginal revenue expression captures. It's, it's the price reduction on the inframarginal amounts, right? Not the marginal amount, but everything, all the quantities leading up to that point uh, need a price discount in order for the whole thing to be sold. And that price discount is the source of the gap between the demand curve and the marginal revenue curve. Yes? Um, okay, any questions? So as usual, need not need belaboring, uh, what a competitive market would have produced, assuming things like externalities, et cetera, are not there, all these other factors which make markets inefficient are not present in this, in this market, in this situation. Assuming that Q star, what a competitive market would have produced with the socially optimum quantity, we have been discussing this you know, many, many times, and if the monopolist produces less than that, then this dead weight loss is created. Uh, um, you know, um, so take, take an example to, to drive home the point even more. Take the case of, uh, you know, critical medicine supplies. So uh, if there appears a cure for cancer, you know, uh, the vaccines right at this point, uh, there are some therapies which have been developed by Pfizer and other companies. So these are absolutely critical uh, drugs and medicines for uh, public health around the world. Yes. Um, now, if pharmaceutical companies, so, so you know, there are consumers in America and Europe whose willingness to pay is much higher. So they're the uh, the, the pharmaceutical companies can charge a uh, relatively high price. Uh, if they want to expand into African markets, for example, which are much poorer on average, uh, they have to lower the price, yes? Uh, and from purely their profit calculations, that may not be worth it. So we can have a situation where we have a very important medicine, which, is, which could save you know, thousands or millions of lives, is available. But uh, the, the optimal profit maximizing uh, pricing is, is uh, such that it shuts out poor markets like you know, most of African markets and um, so on, or, or poorer segments in Asia and, and so on and so forth. Um, so what is the solution? Let's, let's briefly talk about this. Let's take Vaccines, for example, right? There's a whole lot of discussion about vaccine inequity. Um, the vaccination rate in, in most European countries is you know, 60, 70, 80%. It's, it's, most of them are above 60%, some are above 80%. Uh, the US, I mean, the only reason it's not higher is because of vaccine hes hesitancy among a section of the population. Whereas uh, many African countries, including countries which have imported new strains to the world, like South Africa, they are very low vaccination rates, uh, under 10%. So what should be the global approach, broadly speaking, to, to this uh, issue? So block pricing. I mean, we could charge different price to different sections, given what they can pay for that. Like what we are doing in Delhi right now, 
we are offering free vaccines as well as well as private hospitals are pr uh, providing private uh, vaccines as well at a price so people who are able to buy them at that price are going there to get the vaccines and poor people who can't afford to pay a thousand rupees for that vaccine are going to government schools or government centers to get the vaccine so dual pricing of some sort yes sir Right. I and mean, the thing with vaccines is that if you if you push the drug, drug companies too hard and force them to sell uh, lots and lots uh, of, of vials at substantially below cost, and if it doesn't recover their R&D expenditures, uh, development expenditures, then you, you really blunt the incentives for innovation and, and vaccine research and medical research in the future. So that's one thing which is delicate, which has to be balanced against uh, the issue of access. And what you're pointing out is that uh, uh, if there's a way to move away from the law of one price, that there has to be one global price for, for the product, uh, why not have a high price for richer markets like, uh, uh, like America uh, and, and another lower price for Africa? Now, one potential problem there is what? Arbitrage. Arbitrage. One is arbitrage, okay? So, so if, if uh, entrepreneurs in Africa can pick up a lot of these in, in at cheap prices and turn it around and sell it to European markets, for example, then that kind of spoils this. Uh, you know, it beats the purpose. Uh, poor Africans don't get the vaccines, whereas uh, profits are pocketed by other entities who are just rent seekers. Uh, another, what's another? possible problem with that other than arbitrage so is it difficult a little difficult to determine different prices for different markets like why so some it might be difficult uh, no, explain why why you think it's difficult to charge i mean we talked about arbitrage right arbitrage could be a, a potential problem in trying to do price discrimination across market segments other than that is there any other reason so the market segments are different from one market to the other we can't be, be we're not able to divide the two markets properly so the segmentation it's not perfect so in that situation sometimes it might be difficult to decide which price should be charged where like it's it's more fluid i mean it's not watertight the market segments so for example if for, for a product you are you know you want to charge different prices for students and non students uh, it's kind of porous right i mean i even if I, i'm not a serious student of any course I could sort of enroll perhaps in a, uh, some sort of sham uh, course and show the documentation and buy all kinds of things uh, at a cheap rate, at a student rate. So I guess that's what you're, you're referring to, that uh, the boundaries are not firmly drawn. So that is kind of related to the arbitrage point, right? The arbitrage is where you can just change, the product can change hands. And this is that people can jump from one box to another. So, so yeah, uh, that would be, uh, in the case of vaccines, that is, I think, I think they're fairly compartmentalized to a large degree. Right? These are different countries after all. Um, the, the one potential problem is these sort of entrepreneurial arbitrage. Uh, uh, people buying it up in, in mass quantities in poor countries and then finding a way to smuggle it to, to rich countries. Um, See, vaccine is not a one-shot market, right? Or medical supplies or what have you. Uh, it's, a, it's a flow commodity. I mean, this month, some people are getting vaccines. Next month, there will be other people getting vaccines. So the drug companies are producing and selling it, and it's kind of repeated. Yes. So even if you want to do price discrimination, you will still have a pecking order, isn't it? If you, if you figure out that well, uh, Africa is a poorer market. If I charge North American prices, we'll find very few sellers. So we'll charge a lower price for Africa, whether for profit reasons or for you know um, maybe more social reasons. But nevertheless, you want to push that back as a, as a pharmaceutical company, which has a, a 
strong eye on its bottom line. It, it, it'll rather finish selling uh, in the uh, markets where it can charge high prices and then turn around to, to these other markets. So, so the vaccine inequity problem uh, doesn't necessarily go away. But price discrimination, charging different prices for different market segments can to some extent, you know, that's one point which has emerged over here, which is that uh, this, uh, this effect of monopoly that the, in, in some sense, the monopolist creates artificial scarcity, right? It, it produces uh, too little, uh, case, uh, creates a scarcity, drives up the price in the process, and that, that uh, strengthens its bottom line. So uh, if it can charge different prices for different market segments, then I think we can see already somewhat broadly that this, uh, this incentive to create artificial scarcity at least relaxes to some degree, right? We can, we can see that qualitative point. So to explore that, I'll, I'll get into price discrimination models now. Yes, Shishi. Uh, so you mentioned this argument of the pecking order that the supplier, the, the monopoly, uh, the monopolist would always want to provide to to supply to the market that it is uh, you know subjecting to the higher price, so it can gain uh, the higher revenue first. So can this argument be made for any sort of market for any uh, for any good and not just vaccines? Like, is yes. it true in any monopolist market? Yes. So this last point, which I uh, mentioned, which would uh, reduce the power of price discrimination in expanding access, uh, that point will arise for products where production is gradual. You cannot produce everything in one go, or somehow you don't have the capacity to do so, or you haven't invested in the capacity to do so. Uh, and, and so to serve the market, uh, it, it, it takes a period of time. Right? That may not be true for certain products, and that may be very critical for certain other products. And for vaccines, it's clearly important. One of the issues is not whether people get the vaccines, but whether people get them quickly enough to, to prevent the spread, emergence of new variants. Right? So the speed at which uh, the world can be served and vaccinated is, is a very important dimension over there. Um, for other markets, more like consumer durables, for example, like cars. Yes. Um, in the production of cars, I don't think they are um, running to catch up with demand. You know, at any point in time, they more or less have the capacity to serve uh, uh, people who want uh, to, to, to buy cars. Um, so, yeah, it depends on the product. Okay. Uh, gradual production and servicing of the market, whenever that is a feature, uh, that will lead to this sort of pecking order issue. Right? Lower priced market segments will get it last. Nilava. Sir, isn't vaccine production a natural monopoly? Like the marginal cost will decrease as we increase production? Well, yes and no. Right. If it were, if there were only one vaccine, then it would be would have been a natural monopoly. But there is competition between Pfizer and Moderna and AstraZeneca, so it's more like an oligopolistic market. Yes, and moreover, I think in such a critical product, um, sellers have to weigh, even if they have a monopoly, if it's like such a life-saving drug or you know it's so so intimately connected to global health. There are political constraints on pricing, I think. You know, there's, a, uh, there's this famous incident of a guy called Martin Shkreli, I think his name is. He brought up a drug company which produced a very vital medicine, okay? I mean, the medicine had a small market, but for people with a certain disease, that medicine was absolutely life-saving. And soon after buying up that company, he raised the price of the medicine to astronomical levels, right? from like 10 bucks to uh, 10,000 bucks or something like that. I forget the exact numbers, but it was uh, such an increase that it grabbed headlines across the world. It, New York Times and other uh, outlets uh, sort of started publishing that. Oh, no, this, is, this is the example of a greedy capitalist who, who has uh, no compassion whatsoever. Um, 
And then Martin Shkreli went, strutted around, right? he went to talk shows and, and said, well, this is capitalism, live with it. He was very cocky about it. And uh, so after a while, he got charged for something else. I don't know, tax evasion or I forget what. Uh, so, so he became so unpopular that uh, American, the American government went looking for any loophole they could find to, to, to uh, get to him. <laughs> so, uh, in the real world, you know, for very essential products, sometimes uh, it, it, it'll be naive to say that the monopoly pricing would be completely determined by economic factors alone, perhaps. Sir, is it economically inefficient to have more than two, three companies produce vaccines, given that the marginal cost of producing a vial is, is almost negligible. The entire cost is actually the R&D that goes behind it. So in general terms, the average cost of a company that's producing a vaccine is downward sloping. That's, that's a very important, interesting question. I won't be able to do justice to that question, but let me still make a few points, right? Without kind of nailing um, uh, a very neat answer. Uh, in the R&D literature, theoretical R&D literature, there's always this tension between too much R&D and too little R&D. And there are economic factors which may push in either direction, right? Uh, too much R&D happens when, this is exactly what you said, there's, there's too much duplication, right? Um, 10 companies, 20 companies are in a race to discover the same product. And, and then uh, from an aggregate resource allocation point of view, uh, if I get overextended, we may have too much R&D behind a product. Uh, but there are other reasons why uh, there may be too little R&D too, okay? The reason that can, there can be too much R&D is what is called the business destruction effect, that if I manage to discover a new product, a better product from the existing one, let's say, then I destroy the profits of the existing company, right? There's a medicine, I'm trying to discover a better, more effective medicine or, or vaccine. Uh, in the process, I destroy profits of some firms, which I don't internalize. So then uh, firms may do end up doing too much R&D. On the other hand, when a new product is discovered, the social value consists of consumer surplus as well as producer surplus, right? And when firms are investing in R&D, they are not internalizing the consumer surplus part of it. Even if they have a monopolist, they will leave some consumer surplus with, with consumers. And that's not something which translates into profits for themselves. And that is the reason why they may invest too little. Uh, so, so that's a general kind of backdrop about, you know, uh, will, will uh, uh, innovation and uh, investment in R&D be socially efficient purely through the free market and, and private incentives. It, it's complicated, it, was, it could go either way. Uh, I think the economists, I mean, the political leaders in our country, they didn't really look at economic efficiency. Probably they wanted at least one vaccine to come as soon as possible. And that's why yeah. they delegated this particular job to so many industry, companies. Right, but but be, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, uh, how many, uh, firms should uh, do R&D for a particular product like a vaccine or a medicine. The answer to that, you know, what is the socially efficient number? That is not necessarily one, right? For vaccines, time is of the essence. And uh, if, uh, if only Pfizer was doing vaccine research for-, for And probably for, we would have gotten it very late. They may have failed. Uh, it could have been, it could have come much later. Uh, if they had no competition, maybe they would do it slowly. So there are all kinds of reasons. Well, that's a private incentive part. But even if it was a command and control economy, you may want to create multiple vaccine research centers if it's a very, very important product and time is of the essence, right? So the optimal number of uh, vaccine research enterprises is not one necessarily. Uh, there's an interview with Bill Gates where he sort of spells out this point. This is earlier, you know, before all these vaccines were approved. He said that we have not only invested in multiple research lines, but also started creating the production facility for them. Yes, because you don't know which one will uh, work, which one will be effective and get approval, uh, but you don't want to, you want to, it's like a relay race, right? Where, where you, 
uh, want to stay as far front as possible and wait for the baton to come along. So uh, whether the government or whether a funding agency or a firm, uh, it may be optimal for them to open three, four different independent lines of research into the product. Um, all duplication is not bad. Some duplication just increases your chances of developing the product or developing it earlier. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is, because there are multiple vaccines now in the market, there is some competition and that's uh, good for access. We don't have a pure monopoly. We have some oligopolistic structures. So that's, that's another reason perhaps for uh, giving some social encouragement to uh, multiple firms uh, to do the research. And the other thing is that, as I mentioned, the speed, right? Um, because there are multiple companies who have come up with more or less uh, similar, in terms of effectiveness, more or less similar vaccines, um, we have greater production capacity. So, so these things are being churned out faster than if it, if it was just one single firm. Now, the other question which is that most of the fixed cost is related to R&D. That's actually not true. Yes, there are huge fixed costs even after uh, a vaccine has been discovered. Uh, see, vaccines are very, very specialized products. So for a particular vaccine, you know, if it's a MMR vaccine or the uh, COVID vaccine, think it is not easily substitutable. So for each vaccine, you have to set up um, its, its own production plant. It requires its own customized equipment. A, a lot of things, there's a lot of customization. So, but even given that we have a lot of additional fixed costs, the marginal cost of producing one vial. Yes, yes, but but if we, you know, since we are in a, you know, it's supplied by uh, private producers, uh, you have to devise a system where the fixed costs are recovered. That's why I'm saying that there are fixed costs of research, which are substantial. There are also fixed costs of production, which are substantial, right? And the manual costs are relatively low. Yes, but if somehow uh, uh, policymakers and regulators uh, peg the price at marginal cost, then a huge amount of fixed costs, both on the coming from the research side and the production side, it won't be recovered. It yes, won't be recovered, right? This is something in the you know. Remember, there was this all this debate in the newspapers about uh, pricing issues and etc. They're charging too much. It's not so simple. I mean, maybe they were charging too much. Maybe they got a good deal. But uh, we need to know about the cost structure, especially the fixed costs, to determine how much markup and how much volume will lead to the recovery of these fixed costs. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Let me now move on to price discrimination. Uh, so let's start at a very, uh, with a very stylized and extreme, if somewhat unrealistic assumption, uh, so that the purpose of the assumption is to, is to make us understand the, the full power of price discrimination, right? If price discrimination could be uh, pushed to its limit, which is not to say in the real world it is pushed to its limit, but if it could be pushed to its limit, what is the limit? The limit is the ability to charge a different price from each consumer. So let's first focus on price discrimination across consumers, across people. Um, so perfect price discrimination, or what is sometimes called price discrimination of the first degree, is where the, um, the seller uh, has the ability to charge a very individualized price. And moreover, in our at this starting point of our analysis, we'll assume that um, the seller knows each consumer's willingness to pay. Okay, so let's let's get into the model. Uh, let's take a unit demand model, right? So each consumer buys zero or one unit. Okay, uh, let's say it's a car or a, you know, a washing machine. You either buy it or you don't. You don't need you know ten washing machines. Uh, so these are unit demand models. And each consumer has some willingness to pay, which is V, right? So V is their valuation of this product. If they buy it, they're willing to pay up to V and not anymore. Of course, they'll be happy to pay less than that. Uh, 
And let's assume there's a continuum of consumers and their Vs, their individual Vs follows a distribution, which is a smooth, you know, it's like a probability distribution, will we'll normalize the measure of consumers to one. So, it, 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 so this F of V, which is the distribution of uh, uh, the valuation of the willingness to pay in the population, that is exactly like a, a probability distribution, right? So F of V is a distribution function and it will have a corresponding density function. It would differentiate it. Small f of v uh, is what you get. And that is the density function of the probability distribution. Um, and as I said, we'll start with the extreme somewhat stylized assumption that the, uh, each consumer has his valuation written on his face somehow, on their forehead, you know. <clears throat> Uh, sci-fi kind of assumption, their Vs are written on their foreheads. They cannot hide it. They cannot pretend otherwise. Bear with me on that assumption. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, relaxing and talk about more realistic ways of achieving price discrimination. Uh, so this is perfect price discrimination of the first degree. So what will the seller do? What is the seller's problem even? Uh, well, the seller, of course, anybody uh, the monopolist sells to will be charged their personal V. There's no reason to charge anything less. You can, you can see the V of every consumer walking through the door. Uh, somebody walks through, they're willing to pay 10 lakhs for the car, you charge them 10 lakhs. Somebody else walks through, uh, willing to pay up to seven lakhs. If you decide to sell to this person, then you will have to charge seven lakhs, right? Uh, 10 lakhs will uh, send him away and less than seven lakhs uh, will be uh, too generous from the monopolist profit perspective. So, uh, so the only real decision for the monopolist is to choose a threshold that I will only serve customers whose willingness to pay is above some threshold. Below that, I'll say, sorry, this is not for you. Uh, you're not willing to pay enough. Um, and so the monopolist problem can be formulated simply as choosing the threshold. The rest of it is trivial. Right. Above the threshold, charge each consumer their individual V. Okay, so how can we set up the monopolist problem? The threshold is V star. Remember that in this, in this exercise that we're just uh, setting up, V star is a choice variable. Yes, uh, once it's chosen, it's, it's, it's pegged, it's fixed, but it's something the monopolist chooses. So V star is a choice variable, yes, of this problem. Uh, so if the monopolist chooses some V star, some arbitrary V star, everybody whose willingness to pay is above that um, uh, buys the product and they're charged their individual V. So this is the expected revenue, right? Uh, the the uh, total V or willingness to pay of all consumers whose values lie above the threshold V star. So this is the revenue of the monopolist. Minus this is the cost, okay? Uh, what is the fraction of consumers who have uh, values above the threshold that the monopolist has set? Well, that's one minus F of V star, right? The standard uh, uh, interpretation of a distribution function. So those are the number of units the monopolist will be selling. Remember, uh, people buy either zero units or one unit. So this is the fraction of people who end up buying under the monopolist scheme. And so that's also the number of units that the monopolist sells. So plug that into the cost function. Okay, so the choice variable, remember, is V star. And so the monopolist will choose V star. So basically, you have to set the first derivative of this equal to zero. That gives us the solution. Now, the one thing in purely calculus terms is that the thing that we are differentiating, the second term is, is simple. In the first term, the choice variable is one of the limits of the integral, okay? Uh, it does not appear inside the function directly. It is part of the uh, limit. It's the lower limit of what we are integrating. Now, in calculus, there are techniques to, to uh, calculate the derivative when uh, the variable appears in, in the limits of an integral. Uh, I'm sure you guys have learned it at some point. 
it's called Leibniz rule. So I won't, uh, of course, prove it or something, uh, but let me just state briefly that if you are differentiating with respect to the lower limit of the integral, Leibniz rule tells us that uh, the value of that derivative is the function with v, the variable replaced by v star and a negative sign in front, okay? If v star was sitting at the top of the integral, then again, we'll take the function that we are integrating, just insert v star over there and leave it with a positive sign, not a negative sign. Now, you know, if I had time, I could give you a little bit of intuition about where this uh, Leibniz rule comes from, if not the proof, but I, uh, you know, if you're mystified by that, just, just look it up. Okay, so I'll, I'll apply Leibniz rule over here. And as I said, uh, just take the function we're integrating, insert v star, the, the limit, and put a minus sign. So that's our derivative. And when you differentiate this part of the profit function, um, chain rule again. So we have margin cost term, and then the derivative of what's inside. And what's inside, when you differentiate the distribution function, you get the density function. There's a minus sign, so there's, there'll be a minus sign. Um, uh, um, yes, and, and so that's equal to zero. So we end up with this, uh, V star equal to C prime. Now, um, if you look at this condition that we have derived, this condition is basically the price equals marginal cost condition, right? Um, for any quantity, if you uh, go up to the demand curve and look at the price at which that quantity will sell, in this framework, what is the interpretation of the height of the demand curve at some aggregate quantity? It, it's the value of the last consumer who's being allowed to buy the product by the seller, right? So V star is the value of the last consumer who gets through the door and in a competitive market, that would have been the price, right? So we, we essentially end up with price equals marginal cost. Um, I'll, I'll come to it. Let me just, let me just complete. Uh, so the point is, instead of a monopolist, if this market was served by a price-taking firm or a perfectly competitive market structure, the number of consumers who would be served would be exactly what this price discriminating monopolist is doing, right? The overall quantity is the same when we have a perfectly price discriminating monopolist versus a perfectly competitive market, right? Now, what is the key intuition? What is the reason, right? So we have see a dramatic difference if the monopolist was somehow because of reasons of arbitrage, because of reasons of law, non-discrimination clauses in the law, what have you, if, if he was not allowed to price discriminate, he would create artificial scarcity, drive up the price, there will be deadweight losses, the typical inefficiency of monopoly. If we allow the monopolist to perfectly price discriminate, all that inefficiency at least goes away. Yes, we have efficiency restored. The reason why efficiency is restored is very easy to see. Let's, let's take a shortcut around uh, these, these mathematics and these derivations. Perfect price discrimination means there's no consumer surplus. You take away, the seller takes away every last drop of consumer's surplus from consumers. He has the ability to do so and the free hand to do so. So that means social surplus becomes synonymous with the monopolist's profits because the consumer surplus part of it is zero. So maximizing profit becomes equivalent to maximizing social surplus. So, so that's why you, we have efficiency restored. Now, having pointed that out, let me now draw your attention to something very, very important in our understanding of monopolies. The reason we, why, why we worry about monopoly are two, they're not one, they're two completely distinct reasons. One is efficiency, uh, the other is equity. Right. Uh, if you think of the monopolist uh, as a big, powerful financial entity, its shareholders are all rich people and people buying the product. Maybe it's a life saving drug. Maybe they're 
many of them are very poor people. Uh, and, and if you think that, you know, um, that um, this is unfair, that um, all the surplus generated by this product, this market, goes to this, to this rich company, uh, then that's one reason to worry about monopoly. The other reason is the potential for deadweight loss, right? Uh, the, if you go from perfect competition to monopoly, the monopolist may raise his profits by a thousand rupees above the competitive level, but consumer surplus will go back, go down by more than that, maybe by 1200 rupees. So that extra 200 rupees loss in consumer surplus, that is our deadweight loss. So, so in his uh, attempt to extract as much profit as possible from the situation with a unit single uh, pricing rule, uh, these deadweight losses arise. So the comparison between no price discrimination and perfect price discrimination sort of illustrates these two separate issues and, and emphasizes that they're separate. When we move to price discrimination, the inefficiency part, the deadweight loss part disappears. That's a good thing. But things become much more unequal, right? Now consumer surplus is absolutely uh, run dry. Uh, so if you go back to our example of, you know, vaccine inequality in the world, even if poor African countries do get it, uh, we discussed that, you know, it may come later because of the pecking order issue. But nevertheless, yes, ac access expands, but, but the monopolist has more powerful instruments to extract the consumer surplus from each market segment. So, so the division of the surplus becomes much more unequal. So, so if all we could do is allow or stop price discrimination, if we didn't have any other uh, possible instrument of intervention, the answer of whether it should be allowed is, is not obvious at all, and it can be debated because allowing it removes, it increases efficiency, decreases deadweight loss, but it also creates a much more unequal outcome between the seller and the buyers. And, and that's a separate issue in itself. Okay. Um, Shishir, you have a question. Uh, yes, sir. So can we say that in the case of price discrimination of first degree price discrimination, the MR and the demand the marginal revenue and the demand curve curve actually overlap? I mean, <clears throat> I wouldn't use the term marginal revenue over there. Uh, or, or, yes. Well, okay, fine. I mean, you can put it that way. That uh, when you are perfectly see, that's the thing. What did I say? You know, when there was a law of one price imposed on the monopolist, he could charge a single unit price. Then, if he wants to sell more, bring in a new consumer, uh, he was forced to reduce the price on the existing consumers, right? The 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 uh, people he were uh, willing uh, planning to sell to anyway. Um, under price discrimination, that part is not there. You can bring in a new consumer, give him a discount. Sell, him, sell it to him at a lower price, but not lower the prices on the previous guys, because you are assumed to have perfect price discrimination parts. And that's why that negative term disappears. And yes, you can, you can put it that way, that marginal revenue then basically goes back and, and coincides with the demand curve. So can you go? Yeah, sorry, sorry, go ahead. So can you go over the cost part once? This is... the cost part is standard marginal cost right uh if we the have inside a... part is the fraction of people whose thresh... whose willingness is over the threshold level right that's right and it is a fun and cost is a function of that that fraction that's right okay sir no sir i was confused because you said the fraction can tell us how many people are actually buying the cars i was confused yeah, that's how... that is true so, so this how can you say that there's uh Consumers are of measure one, right? So if everybody buys a car, a number will be one. Um, now, what does the capital F function uh, signify? It signifies how many people or what fraction of consumers have a valuation less than whatever you, you put into the function, V star, right? So the people whose values are below V star don't buy. So the remaining people, one minus this, are the buyers. Right. Yes, so it captures the fraction of people who will buy if the threshold is set at V star. 
Okay. Yes, sir. Now, because it's a unit demand model, people buy either zero unit or one unit. So if 40% of the people are buying, uh, each of them buys one unit, then the overall sales is also 0.4. Okay, sir. So this is, this is synonymous with the number of people buying and the number of products sold. So it's total sale, uh, it's uh, people buying upon total sales. That's possible. Yes, so number, num number of people buying, we have normalized that to one. Okay, sir. Right, so, so therefore we don't have to divide by anything really. We're dividing by one right, in the process. Other questions? Um, no other questions? Okay, let me move on to another kind of price discrimination, yeah, which is, you know, these textbooks have these names which have been carried over for a long time back. They're not the best possible names to give. Um, but anyway, let's, let's use first degree is where, where you have uh, perfect price discrimination across consumers. Uh, now, for many products, each consumer buys a variable quantity. It's not a zero one thing, right? How much ice cream will it buy? The ice cream market is monopolized by whoever, uh, Mother Terry. Um, so then uh, the monopolist also has to, has to think about uh, how much he wants each, each consumer to buy. So, Suppose price discrimination across people is not an issue. So each consumer is like a separate island. Let's, let's assume that, right? First, price discrimination across has been taken care of. So, so you can forget about everybody else, focus on one single consumer and do it one at a time. Right? Now that single consumer has his own demand function and it's not a unit demand thing. It varies continuously with price. Uh, so if the monopolist was somehow constrained to charge a single unit price to this consumer. Right? No matter how much you buy, you can buy at 20 rupees per unit. Um, then that will leave some consumer surplus, obviously. The usual diagram, that triangle, you know. Uh, so there's potential consumer surplus to extract, to steal by the monopolist. Um, so second degree price discrimination arises when the monopolist can charge different prices for different quantities from the same consumer. Uh, that is called second degree price discrimination. And there are all kinds of examples you can think of from the real world. You know, they're sometimes uh, done in a roundabout way. Uh, you can have bulk discounts, right? You go to clothing stores, they give buy two, get 50% off on the third, or buy two, get one free. That sort of deal is always going on, which essentially amounts to what I'm talking about. Uh, you have multi-packs, right? You can buy a single can, a can of soda, or you can buy a 12-pack. And often the price it so that uh, the per can price in a 12-pack may be lower than uh, that of a single pack. Uh, electricity pricing very much follows, uh, you know, um, as you know, in, in many cities, uh, you have this you know, electricity rates are cheap up to a threshold. And then as you consume more and cross that threshold per month, your, your unit price price starts rising. So these are all examples of nonlinear pricing. It's, it's almost like price discrimination within a consumer, within a person. Uh, so that's called second degree price discrimination. And then there's, <laughs> third degree price discrimination, which is talked about, which is kind of a cruder version of first degree price discrimination. Often what sellers can do is that they cannot tell the willingness to pay of each consumer down to the individual level, but they can tell that average willingness to pay across observable groups are different. So for example, st students or uh, senior citizens may have, uh, because of their, they have less uh, cash flows, uh, they may have uh, lower willingness to pay than people in mid-career uh, and so on, you know, middle-aged people. And so, you know, you often see these deals, right? 
uh, student discount. Now you can you can look at it through the lens of benevolence and and social goals that oh you know this company is trying to uh, it's it's not just uh, doesn't just care about profits but even caring about profits would would provide you a reason to offer cheaper prices to some observable dis, observably distinct groups like like uh, students for example or if it's a textbook uh, you may want to charge different prices for the American version or the European version versus the Indian edition. Okay, so third degree is, is first degree in a cruder way. Let's focus on second degree, so-called second degree price discrimination. Um, so I'll discuss it with pictures. Okay, so this is, let's say, the demand curve. Okay. Um, if the monopolist is restricted by law or circumstance or practicality to charge a single unit price, then let's say this is the optimal monopoly price, this is the optimal quantity, and we know that this is less than Q star, this is less than the socially efficient amount. Okay, now suppose, so under this one price rule, this is our, the blue area is our consumer surplus, the, the orange one is our profits. Let's assume that costs are zero, just for simplicity. Okay, I don't want to just draw a cost curve over here, so I've avoided that. Um, this is profits, this is, this is uh, consumer surplus. Um, now, suppose the monopolist can do something like this. He say, okay, up to quantity Q1, you have to pay a higher per unit price P1. After that, I will lower it to PM, okay? So pay more. So this is this is like a bulk discount, yes? Your per unit price comes down as you buy more uh, in a step function like manner. Okay, so if that's the sales uh, strategy of the seller, then how much is consumer surplus in this picture? And how much is profits? So the consumer surplus are the two triangles under the uh, right. the demand curve and between the prices. That's and right. The 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 monopoly profits are just the rest of the area under. So the higher rectangle and the lower rectangle both. Yeah. So uh, everybody see that uh, with this uh, two part pricing, like, like two block pricing. Um, for the first Q1 units, since the higher price is being charged, the consumer surplus is only the area be between the demand curve and that higher price line. But once we cross Q1, uh, it's a lower price, which is relevant. And again, consumer surplus is as usual, uh, the area between the demand curve and the newly relevant lower price. So that's this triangle. And this rectangle is therefore the additional profits that the monopolist is making through his ability to do this sort of block pricing. Yeah. So by creating two price slabs, the monopolist has managed to eat into some of the consumer surplus. Now, in principle, you can keep pushing the envelope and carrying this further and further. So for example, suppose you can do three blocks like this. Uh, up to Q1, the price charge is P1. Up to Q2, the price charge is P2. And up to QM, it is lowered further to PM. By the same logic, this is what the picture looks like. Consumer surplus is the sum of these three little triangles. And uh, more of the bigger triangle, the initial consumer surplus, has been eaten into or captured by the seller and converted into profits. Yes. Now, what is the extreme limit of this? Suppose the monopolist can do a very sophisticated kind of pricing where the price changes or depends in a continuous manner with the quantity that the consumer wants to buy. And in particular, the monopolist can choose a pricing scheme which essentially grazes the demand curve, right? He essentially takes the demand curve, he has estimated, and he says, for any quantity you want to buy, the price you have to pay is the height of the demand curve. Uh, and that, means that all the consumer surplus is now 
converted into profits. So now the only question that remains is, what is the quantity that the monopolist will want to sell to this guy? Yes. So for example, if, if costs are zero in this picture, what will be the optimal quantity for the monopolist? There you can so see- The entire demand curve that he sells. The optimal quantity will be whichever maximizes consumer surplus, right? Because all the consumer surplus can be extracted through this nonlinear pricing. So, so you uh, produce this quantity up to this point where the, you know, because of zero marginal costs, he'll, he'll choose this quantity where, where demand is exhausted. And he'll capture this entire large triangle through this nonlinear pricing formula, which, which essentially raises the demand curve. So that is second degree. Back to the first degree price discrimination when we do that. So essentially when we are saying that the monopolist is able to graze the demand curve, yeah. are we going back to the first degree price discrimination? Is we it... are, yes, we are essentially doing that. The only distinction is that there it was across people and here it is across the different units purchased by the same person, same consumer. But it's essentially the same thing, yeah. Okay, sir, thank you. Just in a moment, I'll talk about what is called a two-part tariff. That's an alternative way of extracting all the consumer surplus from a single consumer, okay? So that has no equivalent to the uh, price discrimination across people case. So a two-part tariff is where uh, the seller can charge two prices. One is like an entry fee, that if you want to buy from me at all, you pay a subscription fee, an entry fee or whatever, which is flat, which is independent of how much you choose to buy later. And then there is a per unit price. Okay, it's like a club. You you uh, have to pay an annual membership fee, and every time you go and visit the restaurant or use the pool, you have to pay a user charge. Right? So that's called two-part pricing. And the next point I'm going to make is that two-part tariffs of this sort can, in principle, mimic second-degree price discrimination perfectly. Right, but that is entirely a single-person instrument. Okay, uh, so. So, but yeah, the basic idea is the same. You, you somehow uh, soak up all the consumer surplus uh, by varying the price across people and by varying the price across units for the same buyer. So, so essentially, you can consume. Uh, you can uh, the the monopolist can soak up all the consumer surplus from a single consumer, but not throughout all the consumers using the two part tariff. I'm coming to two part tariff. I'll, I'll explain it. Okay. Sir. Sir, I had a yeah. doubt in the last slide. Yeah. Sir, in the last slide, mm. the consumer that the monopolist is charging the price till the demand till the end of the demand curve. That is the entire area under the demand curve. Mm -hmm. So, sir, in that case, like he is charging the consumer is purchasing all the quantities starting from the uh, top where the price should be zero. Price is the highest. Yeah. So, so the consumer is purchasing uh, from the highest point of the price to the zero price level, all the quantities. In that way, is he extracting it? That's right. Okay. Sir. Let's let's say the equation for the demand curve is P equal to one minus Q. That's exactly the formula that the monopolist will uh, put in front of the of the uh, consumer. Will say, okay, you know, you're you're uh, price for every successive unit will, will be this formula. So your first unit will cost you one. But as you buy more, I will charge less and less for these successive purchases following the formula P equal to one minus Q. And where did the P equal to one minus Q come from? That's the demand curve he has estimated for this consumer. Okay, sir. Okay, got it, sir. Okay, now uh, two-part tariff. Right. As I said just a moment ago, two-part tariff is uh, uh, an alternative way in which uh, monopolists can do second-degree price discrimination. Right. One way is, of course, to have this uh, uh, variable pricing formula, nonlinear pricing, that you know your price is conditioned on how much you're buying. But that can get somewhat complicated. Right. A simpler way of implementing the same thing for the seller is a two-part tariff. Uh, there are plenty of examples of uh, sellers 
uh, exercising this kind of option. I already mentioned, for example, private clubs, right? They'll, they'll do that. You have, um, I don't know, all kinds of things, right? These days on Amazon, you can get an Amazon Prime membership, which is a fixed fee annual, and that gives you faster delivery, whatever, et cetera. Um, uh, um, you know, this is this is a screenshot from the website of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is one of the greatest art museums in the world, located in New York City. So, if you ever visit New York City, this should be towards the very top of your list. It's it's an absolutely amazing place. Uh, if you look at their pricing policies, first of all, you see sort of what they call third degree price discrimination, right? There's a separate price for senior citizens, for students, identifiable group of people. You can, you can identify them through uh, IDs and stuff. Um, so that's uh, across people. But you also see two part tariffs, right? So for a single visit, the charge is $25. But the same, uh, you have this other option, you can buy an annual membership for $70, right? I think this gives you free access, but you know, in other situations you can have, well, for every visit you pay less than this $25, right? it could be $5. It happens to be $0 in, in this case. Uh, so that's two part pricing. Uh, if, a, if a bookseller, for example, sells that uh, you have to become a member of our book club, annual membership fee, uh, 1,000 rupees, and every book you buy, you get a 20% discount on that book. That's a two-part tariff. Um, right, so how does it help? Let's do a very little model. There's a single consumer, let's take that quasi-linear utility function, remember, which we started with. So uh, Q is the quantity of the good in question, the good which the monopolist sells. Uh, and M is the money spent on everything else. And it takes this quasi-linear form. The nonlinear part is phi. Phi is increasing and concave, capturing diminishing returns. Now let's give the monopolist a two-part tariff instrument. So the monopolist can charge an entry fee F. That becomes like a fixed cost for the buyer. They have to pay that regardless of how much of their buying, as well as a per unit price P. Um, now, first, let's fix an arbitrary F and an arbitrary P. The monopolist has pulled two numbers out of a hat. What is the consumer's best response? The consumer's best response can be understood by these two lines. First of all, if he chooses to buy at all, let's postpone the question whether it's worthwhile for him to uh, actually uh, enter into this transaction. But if he chooses to buy at all, uh, he pays the gate fee, the entry fee, and then it immediately becomes a sunk cost, right? It shouldn't influence how much uh, Q, how much quantity he wishes to purchase. Yes. Um, you know, if you're becoming a member of a club, uh, maybe you paid a very high entry fee, but if the restaurant is very cheap, then you'll go and eat there often. That makes sense. Once you've become a member, if you have become a member. So, uh, so this is the optimal quantity choice, conditional on paying the entry fee. And since entry fee F is a fixed cost, it doesn't affect the optimum Q. The optimum Q only depends on the per unit price. And it's basically the inverse of the marginal utility function as usual. Yeah. So marginal utility of the quantity she buys should be equal to price. Uh, and, and, and you just invert that to get this. Now, the other thing is what is sometimes called the participation constraint. Um, you figure out for this consumer, what is the optimum quantity? That's a function of P, you put it into the utility function. So what if the consumer takes this deal? This is his net utility, right? Uh, this is the utility from consumption and Y minus the two kind of charges that he has to pay the fixed charge, entry fee, and the, the user charges, given the quantity he's choosing. So this is the money spent on everything else. This is M, the, the last part of it. Uh, so this has to be greater than Y. Why is that? 
if he rejects the offer, if he walks away, doesn't pay the entry fee even, then he spends all his income on other goods. So y equal to n, so that's the benchmark. So this last inequality is just saying that all things considered, it is worthwhile, it has to be worthwhile for this consumer to uh, participate in this deal, okay? Um, so what is the monopolist's problem? The monopolist's problem is to maximize his profit from this consumer, okay? So what is that? That this is the user charges the monopolist collects given the P that he has set. This is the entry fee that is collecting from the same person. And this is the cost function of providing that Q, which this person is going to choose. So this is the profit extracted from this consumer. Um, subject to this participation constraint, right? The question becomes moot if you have priced it in a way that the consumer just quits, then you make nothing, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, assuming that it's worthwhile for the monopolist to serve this consumer at least to some degree, uh, this problem can be formulated as maximizing this profit function subject to this participation constraint. Now, solving it is fairly simple. Notice that the choice of F and P must be such that the participation constraint is binding. This inequality is not strict. If, if the two tariffs are chosen in a way that the inequality is strict, then the monopolist is not optimizing profit because then a very simple thing you can do is raise the value of F, okay? That will continue to satisfy the inequality and will fetch more money for the, uh, for the seller. So, we might just as well replace this problem with the problem where the inequality constraint is replaced by an equality constraint. This thing equal to y. At the moment we do that, we can do a substitution. Notice that the y cancels out from the two sides. And f can be written as phi minus p times q, right? So we do that substitution, replace f by phi minus p times q. And the moment you do that, this P times Q, this revenue term and its negative counterpart, they cancel out, okay? So it's very easy to see, even without putting pen to paper, you can hopefully see that once you get rid of, once you convert the constraint to equality and you get rid of it, you get a simple unconstrained optimization problem where the objective function is this phi thing minus the C thing, okay? And um, so what is the optimal price per unit or equivalently, how much quantity should the uh, seller aim to sell to this consumer? Well, since the objective function has reduced to phi minus C, essentially the derivative of those two functions should be equated to get to the optimal. And what does that say? It says that marginal utility equal to marginal cost. This is the classic um, uh, efficiency condition in these quasi-linear utility models. We've seen it from the first topic. Uh, marginal utility is equal to marginal cost. This is what a competitive market would have done. This is what is socially efficient. So once again, we get the conclusion that uh, uh, while dealing with a single consumer, if the seller, the monopolist can has all the relevant information, especially about demand curve of this consumer, and can perfectly choose a two-part tariff instrument, which is which is a much simpler, right? It doesn't have to give, lay down a complicated nonlinear pricing formula. You have to just say that, okay, you, you pay this entry fee, this annual subscription fee, and then here's the price for every item you buy from me. Um, so just that simple device will restore efficiency. Once again, there is this tension between efficiency and equity. Uh, first of all, why does it restore efficiency? The two-part tariff is very simple. Its logic is very simple. Uh, let's take a downward sloping demand curve, okay? Uh, let's say there's constant marginal cost. A 
essentially what the, so this is cost. So what the monopolist is doing, what his best strategy is, is to choose a price which is equal to his marginal cost. So he offers a very generous price per unit inside the club. He's pricing the restaurant and the pool and the golf, whatever, very cheap at cost. Now, normally that would generate a big consumer surplus for the member of the club. And if the monopolist knows the position of the demand curve and calculate this, this uh, triangle, forget about the practical implementation of it for a moment. In principle, he can, if he, if he has somehow estimated the demand curve, he can calculate the consumer surplus that would arise if he priced at cost, and he can set that equal to his fixed fee. So he can soak up all the consumer surplus by charging a very high entry fee. So this is the general principle of, of uh, to what pricing like this, that uh, the, the pricing is front loaded. You pay a big price in the beginning. Private colleges charge capitation fees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and for user charges, you keep it low. You keep it at, actually at competitive levels, right? Uh, so that restores efficiency, eliminates dead weight loss, but it creates further inequality between the seller and the buyers. And, and so the picture is complicated by that issue. Okay. Um, any questions? So, but this sort of uh, <clears throat> pricing mechanism is only reserved for a single uh, is only reserved to maximize the producer surplus soaking up from a single individual right this can't be replicated to a complete market no so that's what i said that it's 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 uh, customized to a single consumer right right okay yeah uh, so so you can customize things on both dimensions you know for a single consumer you can customize it according to how much he's buying and then you can customize it across consumers and depending on the situation the market the product you can have uh, ability to do both or only one or none, right? So that will depend very much on context. What we are studying is the theoretical possibility of, of price discrimination across these two dimensions, charging different prices to different people and charging different prices, quantity purchase dependent prices uh, or to the same person. So, Ravlin, excuse me, sir. Ravlin? Ravlin, do you have a question? Uh, I'm coming yes, to Nilava. Yeah, Ravlin. So, uh, can you re-explain the um, consumer optimum where we come to the final equation of it? Which part? The two part in the two part tariff case? Yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. The consumer's uh, problem that we were solving before yeah. this slide. So the consumer has two decisions to make. Consumer faces an F and a P. First decision is whether it's worth getting into this deal at all. Okay, so to, to get into the deal, to be in a position to buy from this seller, he has to first and foremost pay this fee. So he makes a decision on that. Okay. And then he decides if, if he chooses to pay the entry fee, if he chooses to become a member of the book club or the social club, he has to decide how much he wants to use of the goods and services they're offering. How many times to go to the restaurant? How many times to use the pool? How many books to buy from them? Yes. So we have to solve it backwards, essentially. So suppose the consumer has decided to pay the entry fee and become a member. Then the entry fee becomes a fixed cost. You've already paid it, you'll not get it back. Even if you don't buy anything at all, that fixed fee is gone, right? So it's not going to influence your decision about how much to consume once you've become a member. Uh, the only thing that affects your decision, this is, of course, assuming a rational consumer, a consumer who doesn't fall, uh, who's not susceptible to the sunk cost fallacy, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, once somebody becomes a member, their choice of Q is obtained, choice of quantity is obtained from this maximization problem. Right? This straightforward. Consumer optimization, like we have done in the very first module, quasi-linear utility, uh, y minus F minus PQ is basically M, how much you, money you're left with after buying this good. Uh, 
so that, which you can spend on other goods. And so you maximize this, that gives you the demand function of the consumer as a function of unit price. And then you go back and revisit that whether the consumer will want to accept this deal in the first place, whether he is willing to pay that entry fee at all or just walk away. And the condition that guarantees that he doesn't walk away is this inequality, okay? If he, if he chooses to accept the deal, the entry fee has to be immediately subtracted. And then he can look forward and anticipate his own consumption decision as a function of you know, what per unit price he'll pay as a function of you know, the restaurant charges. And so it subtracts that amount of money too. And so this is overall utility if he, if he becomes a member of this club. And if he does not become a member, then Y is simply equal to M. And that is his utility. So as long as this inequality holds, uh, the consumer is, all things considered, willing to become a member of the club, right? So that becomes the participation constraint of the seller, the monopolist. And the monopolist, when we look at his, uh, profit maximization problem, the only constraint he has to keep in mind is that he doesn't want to drive the consumer away. And so he wants to respect the participation constraint. Subject to that, he chooses F and P to maximize his profits. Got it, sir. And so uh, one more doubt I have. Uh, when you were talking about restoring the efficiency. Say that again. Uh, when we were uh, talking about Yes. Restoring the efficiency. Yes. Uh, in the particular case, uh, right. can you show the diagram of it once again? In the two, in a, the nonlinear pricing case, this one. No, sir. The one you drew at the end. Uh, yes, this one. Yes, sir. Uh, what this this basically signifies uh, this F and the. Uh, Rising error. Yes, yeah, so if you look at this picture, one option for the monopolist, and this is what our, our solution is, is to choose a price equal to your cost, right? And then charge a fee, which is this big triangle. Now, compare it to an alternative. Compare it to an alternative where uh, the monopolist sets a higher price here at the restaurant, let's say, greater than marginal cost. Right? Now, how much is the fee? What's the maximum fee he will be able to charge uh, the, the, uh, the consumer uh, without driving him away? That's this entire consumer surplus. If there was no fee, what would have been consumer surplus? That's this uh, green area. So he's able to soak up that under this alternative pricing strategy, right? He sets, uh, a P prime greater than C and he chooses a fixed fee, which of course has to be lower than with the case, which is described in red. Uh, and so what is his overall profits? Well, on every unit, you know, he's charging a price greater than cost. So he's making some profits here, which is the area of the rectangle. So that green area and this green area, which is coming from the fixed fee, add these two up, that is the total profit of the monopolist. Okay. Now, if you look at the green part of the picture, which is which is capturing a strategy of charging higher than marginal costs and keeping a relatively low entry fee, and we're comparing that with the red strategy, which is uh, lowering the price all the way down to marginal cost or charging a higher entry fee, you can easily see now that this uh, uh, this this uh, so this is our uh, first strategy, and this is our second strategy. Uh, P prime greater than marginal cost and then F prime less than F. Uh, the second strategy gives lower overall profits. The monopolist is losing out exactly on this triangle. And so he won't follow the green path, he'll follow the red path. So, uh, so we are considering the whole consumer surplus to be as the fee. Yes. So, sir, why would a uh, consumer be willing to pay the fee as well as the um, Because he's indifferent. Because he's indifferent on the overall deal. 
he gets exactly as much net utility from participating in this deal and not participating in it. Now, if you think that if he's indifferent, he will perhaps, uh, uh, you know, uh, quit, then just reduce the fee by some small amount. Absolutely. If his consumer surplus is 100 rupees, uh, charge him 99 rupees, leave a little dollop with him, one rupee. And, uh, then a rational consumer, at least, not somebody who's spiteful, who's not like those <laughs> those cappuccino monkeys, which I showed in the video, they will still say, oh, you know, I'm getting, if I walk away, I get zero. If I take the deal, I only get one rupee of consumer surplus, but that's strictly more. So what can I do? I wish I was in a better position, but this is accepting the deal is a better choice. So, so you know, indifference is not, doesn't make it knife edge. All, to break the indifference, you can always lower the entry fee by epsilon and make the consumer's preference strict. Okay, sir. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Nilavo. Sir, could you go back to the slides? Uh, okay. Shall we do one thing? You know, uh, I, I wanted to take a break. I, I really... Uh, uh, so this is a good time to take a break. Can I ask the question after the class? You can ask after the class or when we start. I can okay. create a five-minute window where I can take more questions. So sorry, Nilavo Vidushi, just hold off on your question. Uh, Sir, uh, yes. just one second. What is F dash in this diagram? F dash. F dash is the entry fee. Just I'm trying to distinguish it with the, with the F case. F case is where the price per unit has been set low at cost. And then you can charge a higher entry fee. I'm calling that F, uh, writing it with the red ink. Uh, the alternative pricing strategy, which is actually inferior, as I've argued, is uh, they charge a higher price than marginal cost. So that higher price I'm calling P prime. And if they choose a higher price, of course, they can charge a lower entry fee, right? They cannot charge this higher entry fee because the consumer will walk away. So that lower entry fee is F prime. So, so the consumer surplus is the small triangle and this rectangle also. No, not the rectangle. The rectangle is is profit uh, of the seller based on yes, sir. The gap between the unit price they're charging and the cost unit cost of production. Okay. Sir. Okay, guys, I'll I'll take a break. Uh, you have a class at twelve fifty. Is, is there? Is there a class at twelve fifty, guys? So, so we have lunch. One fifty. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, okay, great. Uh, 150, I'm losing track of things. Okay, wonderful. So we'll start again at 12.15. Let's, let me catch my breath, yeah? Okay, so mull over what we talked about and, and ask me any questions afterwards, after we restart. Yes, Nilava, I'll, I'll take a question after the break. Okay, sir. Um, okay, so.